Okay, thanks Kelsey. Um, so as Kelsey said, my name is Walden, first name Brian. We have a naming conflict at work, so we go by last names. Um, I spend all day on GitHub, so that's the best place to actually follow what's happening. Um, yes, I'm on Twitter, but I don't use it, so I don't publish that. Um, so I'm here to talk about two important things. First being etcd, the second one being Kubernetes. Um, etcd and Kubernetes um, already have a pretty important relationship, which is etcd powers Kubernetes. Um, the etcd team is here if you want to talk more in depth about that um, after these next presentations. And I believe Kelsey is actually going to talk wherever he went about um, etcd v2. Um, I am going to be using etcd v2 in this presentation, so some of the commands might look a little bit different from what you're used to, um, but etcd v2 has a lot of really good um, improvements that we really want to um, push on people. We want everyone using etcd v2. Um, okay, so uh, everyone said that they know exactly what CoreOS is, so I don't have to explain etcd, right? Everyone knows exactly how it works, what goes into it, and I'm assuming there's somebody that's just too scared to say no, so I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. etcd is a distributed key value store, uh, to put it simply. Um, it lets you write to an HTTP path some data and get that data back from somewhere else in your cluster. Um, so I'm very demo oriented, so please pardon switching between slides and iTerm a lot. <laughs> uh, wait for it. Okay, so. I said distributed, there are probably multiple nodes involved, right? So we have this cute little command called etcdctl. I can set some path, this is an HTTP path. Um, we strip off the endpoint in front of it because it just doesn't matter. So I can set foo to bar, I can go over to my other node, etcdctl, get foo and see bar. Um, in Chris's presentation earlier, he talked about how they use prevexist and prevalue. Those are um, different methods of writing data into etcd. Prevalue meaning an atomic update, prevexist meaning an atomic create, and those are enforced uh, in the actual server. Um, so I can't really demonstrate that being enforced in the server that well, but I can show you etcdctl create ping pong. I can come over and get ping just like before. Oops. Okay, you guys gotta speak louder. Create, uh-oh. I didn't actually run this command earlier. Oh, it's make now, okay. Like I said, using etcdv2, so it's even gonna trip me up. So make ping pong, get ping, there's pong. If I try and make it again, it already exists. That's an atomic operation right there. That's the primitive for um, shared semaphores across a cluster. So, let's jump back to these slides, uh, present, okay. So, etcd, distributed key value store. Um, for those CS nerds out there, it's linear, linearized consistency. It's not eventual consistency, consistency. It's not some magical consistency. Linear, linearizability is a really hard word to say, and it means that um, changes in the cluster show up in the same order on all of your nodes. Um, it's not using transactions, that's a per um, key operation. So you're guaranteed to see the same set of changes from every node, just not necessarily at the same time, given how uh, the raft consensus algorithm actually works under the covers. So etcd, set keys one place, get keys another place, really helpful. So Kubernetes uses etcd under the covers. It does this for coordination. Um, etcd is a distributed key value store, so you can kind of play with a little bit and store a lot of data in it, a little bit of data, you can use it however you need to. There are best practices, which we can talk about later, because um, I don't know what they are, but Kubernetes uses it for um, <laughs> its persistent data, effectively. So it stuffs whatever data it needs to into etcd, so if the master goes down, it can come back up and keep operating. So Kubernetes is a new project, a lot of us don't know about it. Um, I've just been spending my recent time with it, uh, so ask me two months ago what Kubernetes is, I couldn't really tell you. Um, today I can, I spend all day with it. I'm trying to keep up with development coming out of Google. Um, Kubernetes is an orchestration framework. It's there to um, deploy and manage your containers. So Kubernetes um, groups your containers into a concept called a pod. So a pod is effectively a set of Linux namespaces around containers. Docker containers, um, ACIs, rocket containers, whatever that might be. The current implementation of pods in master is just Docker, um, but very soon there will be an alternate implementation. If you wanna talk about that, Yifan is sitting next to Xiong in the etcd team. So pods are groups of containers. Um, most pods that I've seen are single container um, grouping. 
the, the use case for multiple containers is more on the, um, like the ancillary service use case. Uh, so let's say you're deploying Postgres like Chris is. Maybe you have a backup job that you need to trigger every two days or something to dump your data out, and you don't want to spin up an entirely separate service. Um, maybe you actually have to use IPC for that, so you have to be in the same IPC namespace. Um, I haven't seen a lot of uses of multiple container pods, but there are a lot out there. I just haven't uh, actually played with them. Uh, the next concept we care about here in Kubernetes is the service. So service means a lot of things to a lot of different people. The actual object in Kubernetes is very specific. Uh, it's a load balancer, and it has a virtual IP on whatever uh, overlay network you're running for your, uh, for your pods. So you can run a load balancer with one, uh, one instance behind it. It's not really balancing any load, but <laughs> it's abstracting you away from that thing. Um, enough for you to do really interesting things with it. So we have pods, which are groups of containers. Pods are grouped again behind services. Okay, so Kubernetes taking a new look at things. A lot of the ideas in Kubernetes are coming out of the um, both Borg and the Omega projects inside of Google. So a lot of the decisions that are being pushed by Kubernetes are coming with a lot of real world experience running container-based deployment systems at scale. So looking at scheduling in Kubernetes is incredibly interesting. Um, they're integrating C Advisor all the way up from each node to make an intelligent resource uh, resource scheduling decisions, I guess. Um, like the most efficient bin packing you can possibly imagine. It's not there yet, but that's the path that they're going down. Um, scheduling also comes into play at the, the application level. So what I've learned from building um, Fleet, um, that was my first project at CoreOS, uh, is that you shouldn't try and solve the scheduling uh, you shouldn't try and support all of the different types of scheduling out there. There's a lot, it's really difficult. The first 90% is actually incredibly easy. It's the last 10% that you don't wanna spend your time on and that you could spend the rest of your life on. So scheduling in Kubernetes, um, they're spending the effort to actually get efficient scheduling, um, to, to provide efficient <laughs> scheduling heuristics to everybody, to all of us, effectively for free, which is great. Um, the way that they've designed these objects in Kubernetes, though, allows you to layer your own logic on top of the pod scheduling. So going back to pods, these are actual containers getting scheduled out to hosts. This is where resource scheduling matters. Services are your abstraction on top of those pods. So let's imagine a world where you create your own little pod of your thing that contains your scheduling logic. You can schedule that to Kubernetes and have it actually schedule another application, a higher level application, back to the Kubernetes APIs, making its own decisions. So what I've done here is deploy etcd on Kubernetes using that model. So um, I just built this today, so it's a massive ball of hacks, but that's where it is if you want to look at it. I don't guarantee that it will actually work. Um, it's going to work for me because I have a local copy, uh, but don't go try and build this unless you want to spend a few minutes figuring out um, building uh, this Go project. Okay, so switching back. First, I wanted to give a little bit more information on what this demo environment looks like. Um, for those that haven't used Kubernetes, uh, it's very simple. Oh, is this big enough for you guys? Okay. Um, so pods, services, those are the two entities that we care about right now, but to have a distributed system, you have to have nodes. So I'm actually running a, a Vagrant cluster here, and it's a three node cluster, yeah. So looking at a few things here, um, I know this naming is kind of weird. This is because Kubernetes right now requires that the names of nodes are actually routable given a host name lookup, and I don't run DNS, so I have to use a routable IP for my names. Um, this is a CoreOS cluster, it's running system D. This machine ID is the machine ID slash Etsy slash machine ID from each of the nodes. So let's just, for fun, nope, actually this isn't gonna do what I thought it did. Uh, fleet, nope, oh no, oh no. Uh. Okay, okay, and I said I'd never do this. This is, okay, quick side note. If you have a daemon and a, a command line tool, name them completely unique things. Do not name one a subset of the other because this happens. And <laughs> we renamed fleet to fleet D, but we can't change it now because it's out there. And I make this mistake all the time. And 
Now I have to clean up after myself. So give me a second. Okay. Kelsey. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Whew. So demo gods. Is it fleet CTL list machines? And okay, so I'm actually running um, running Kubernetes on this three-node vagrant cluster. I have to go all the way back to the beginning. Um, <clears throat> I'm running Fleet on one node right now. I know this looks really stupid. Um, I'd actually like to be running a multi-node Fleet cluster for my control plane and in worker nodes that can scale out and not have to worry about Fleet or the control plane or etcd or anything. So I shouldn't have even shown you this, uh, but I did. So there you go. kubectl get nodes. Okay, we're back here, recalibrating. Um, okay, got it. <clears throat> so three nodes. I've got my control plane running on this uh, this 172 um, uh, vagrant node. And I was saying before, machine IDs correlate to systemd machine IDs, just like fleet machine IDs are also systemd machine IDs. So that was a weird little tangent that we can move past uh, kubectl get pods. I'm actually running things on this cluster already. I did this because I didn't know if I'd have Wi-Fi here. So I would like to actually deploy this for you, but you'll have to trust me that the thing that I built does this. So I've got three pods running. I'm debugging or decoding this output here. I've got etcd clust foo peer one, peer two, peer three. I've got three unique 10.2 IP addresses. Um, what is this? etcd? Oh, they're all called etcd, and they're all running this image. Uh, Quay.io, CoreOS, etcd, v2.0.5. Um, looking over here, you see the same IP address repeated twice. This is because of the weird routable naming problem um, also being the routable IP of the Kubernetes nodes. So you can see these three pods are all scheduled to three different nodes. We've got 101, or 102, 103, and 101. Okay. KubeCTL get services. All right, so we just looked at pods. Now let's look at the services that we have available. Um, I said before that services are just load balancers. Load balancers can have one instance behind it. Ideally, there would be a better concept or a better, um, better way to allocate uh, virtual IPs either directly to pods or through some other construct. But right now to do that, I'm creating a service that has one instance behind it, which is the same name as the service name. So I've got etcd clust foo peer one, and I've got etcd clust foo peer one um, pod. And here's my other my virtual IP that gets allocated to this service. Um, this virtual IP is different than, where is it, than this virtual IP um, for a very good reason. That's so my pods can get rescheduled and float around the cluster behind these um, more or less static virtual IPs. Um, this gives me a, a constant target for, like one for, for routing, um, inside the cluster, not having to reconfigure all of my instances, um, but also so I can make um, my, my initial bootstrapping decisions much simpler. Okay, and we'll get into that in just a second. So I've got my three pods, I've got my three services. There's this other service here called etcd clust foo clients. This is actually, like, it's an actual load balancer that's um, routing to each of the client API ports on each of these uh, etcd nodes. Now, if you've run etcd before, you've been confused by the peer port versus the client port. There are very good reasons why we made that distinction. Um, yes, it's confusing, but it makes a lot of sense. Uh, clients point to client ports, peer points to peer ports. So in this cluster, I've got ports 2379 and 2380 are actual IANA allocated ports. This is a completely fresh cluster, no baggage, so I get to do everything the way that I actually want to. Um, and glossing over these two services down here, these are effectively services that Kubernetes itself deploys um, that route back to the Kubernetes APIs. And these help you if you're deploying a scheduler within the Kubernetes cluster itself, so you don't have to um, like actually configure where the thing that you deployed is while you're using the thing. That's really confusing. Um, having this 10.2.0.2 be the same in your cluster everywhere, every time you deploy it, is incredibly convenient. Okay, so we've got our cluster deployed. Um, let me actually prove that it's a, let's prove it's an actual cluster. So this IP address is the, the address of that etcd, uh, what was it? etcd clust foo clients. Yeah, 10.2.205.50, 10.2.205.50. Okay, port 2379, that's the client API port. If I run member list, I've actually got a clustered 
um, deployment here. So I see like these all correlate back to the, the list of pods that we just saw. So I have three unique etcd peers. With unique peer URLs, these correlate back to the, the pod IPs and their client URL, same exact IP, just a different port. So this is just listing the members. This is an API that's new in V2. Um, there are other commands here that I, I hope Kelsey will go into in a little bit, hopefully next. Um, member add, member delete for actual cluster management. Um, when you're adding a new, a new member to a, a consensus-driven cluster like this, you need to care about who the members are. Once the initial bootstrapping is up, you've created a thing. You can't just let that thing run off and try and take care of itself. It's like having a toddler that just wants to kill itself all the time. Um, you have... Okay. Did I take your line, Kelsey? Uh, you, you have to be careful with your cluster. So these, these, mem these member commands, um, that's how you do it. These are, um, these are just HTTP API calls um, behind the scenes. Um, and I guess now would probably be a good time to talk about this other thing. Um, where is it? Oh, okay, cool. So when I got here, I ran this command. Etcd deploy. This is the built binary of the, the project that I pointed you at earlier on GitHub. Um, all it's doing is saying, I want a cluster named foo, I want it to be of size three, and we're creating a new cluster right now. So it dropped out my four services and my three pods, and it said, okay, your cluster's up. Um, this is a one-time step. Um, I literally wrote this today, so this is probably not the right way to do it, but this is, this is what I'm showing you. Um, I have another command here called reconcile, now, my idea of a reconciler is looking at what the desired state of a cluster is or something is, looking at the current state, then building a path um, to rectify those two, typically driving the desired state toward, sorry, driving the current state towards the desired state. Um, that's the model that Fleet uses for, um, for actually running jobs locally and for making scheduling decisions. We say, I have these things that need to be scheduled, and I have a cluster that it should be scheduled to, so what do I do to make that happen? Um, Kubernetes uses that model. Um, Kubernetes is very data-driven. There's a central API that user submits unscheduled pods to. The scheduler comes in and says, says what are all the things that are unscheduled or all the things that are scheduled to invalid targets? Um, and let's reconcile that with an actual like, valid schedule. So I've taken the same approach here in this little tool that I built. It's just a, another scheduler. Um, it's interacting with the, uh, with the Kubernetes API. Once you've deployed your cluster, um, when it comes to reconciliation, it's actually managing the uh, addition and removal of nodes from that etcd cluster. So, like I said, once, you, once you've deployed this etcd cluster, you need to be very careful with it. If you're adding a node, that can't happen automatically. You have to tell everybody that as the privileged, like, as the, the father of these toddlers, you're adding another toddler to this group, or you're replacing one for some odd reason. So, going back to my deploy tool, I'm gonna run reconciler. Um, it's doing effectively the same thing with a couple of little tweaks. So it created these new services, which get services. Um, oh, thank God it worked. So we have our two new services. They look just like the others. The deploy tool also created two pods. Now, when you're reconciling an existing cluster, um, you actually have to um, to deploy these new pods, these new etcd daemons, a little bit differently. Um, there's a flag called uh, initial cluster state, where when it's a new cluster, you set that to new. Um, when it's an existing cluster and you're adding nodes, you set it to existing or exists, um, one of the two. There's documentation on that, don't quote me. Um, so we brought up new services, we brought up new pods. Yep, um, everything's running. Um, that at least means that it started running. The Dates aren't actually that granular right now in Kubernetes, but I know this worked. Uh, I'm gonna run git or member list, and I'm, you see I'm going back through the same exact service IP um, to hit my cluster, and I have two new peers. So given that that worked, that probably means the cluster's healthy. So if I git foo, key not found, set foo bar, succeeded, git foo again, it worked, cool. So I added my two new nodes. Um, I won't bore you with the rest of this tool, mostly because it's all a to-do right now. Um, this should be deployed as a, um, an actual scheduler running in the system, um, monitored by Kubernetes, such that you have a node that dies, you have to schedule uh, a, a new etcd pod somewhere, and you have to, to swap out the old member, add in the new member. Um, so switching back to my slides, um, and again, 
This is the only time you're going to see this link if you. Oop. <laughs> this is the only time you're going to see this link if you care about it. Um, etcd deploy um, should be pretty self-descriptive there. Um, going back to what I was just saying about actually having your scheduler deployed in the cluster, uh, Kubernetes has an event system built into it. <sighs> Give me a second. Okay. Okay, so I can go look at this event system and see literally everything that happened, or literally everything that the cluster decided to tell me about that happened um, since it came up. So you can see things like this node successfully pulled this image, um, this pod was created with this Docker container ID. Um, is there anything else interesting in here? Oh, nope. There's, nope, that's the same thing. Anywho, you can see events about literally everything that's happening in your cluster, um, which is, again, that's another decision that the Kubernetes guys decided on very early. You need to have event-driven um, uh, architecture so that you're not constantly sitting there polling an entire API. And event-driven can mean a lot of different things. Typically, it means send, send the least amount of information that you can to get the most done. Um, this is an example of that. You can watch this event stream. Um, yep, I don't have anything else to say on that. So events, ideally my tool is actually running the cluster. It's a long, long running scheduler. Kubernetes is designed with this in mind. And then just a quick little side note, um, when we're deploying like VM-based workloads, we think about like, EBS or whatever persistent disks we wanna carry around with given VMs. Like let's say we're deploying Postgres and it's really expensive to build up a completely fresh data directory. If you can cache your data into a disk that your infrastructure provider is going to keep alive for you um, across like VM life cycles, then like, it, it's, an, it's an optimization, but it's a really important optimization. This is something that the Kubernetes guys are building into the tool. So right now there's a Google Compute Engine, GCE, um, uh, implementation of this. It's effectively the same as having a disk attached to your VM. When your VM goes away, your disk still exists. You can bring up another VM with the same disk. Um, my, this etcd scheduler that I'm demoing here should be using persistent disks as well, since you can start old, start new etcd nodes, or no, that was a bad way to introduce that. <laughs> I have to be very careful about my terminology, given lifecycle management of etcd is incredibly important. So let's say you lose a node, you can bring that node back up, that etcd node, on a healthy Kubernetes node. We also need to stop calling everything node. You can bring it back up with the same persistent disk and act like nothing happened, like hand wavy, nothing happened, the process doesn't have to know. Um, that's not true if you completely lose a node and lose the disk, or if you have removed that node from the cluster previously. Anywho, that's where I'm gonna stop. Any questions? And remember, I will be standing back up here after the next presentation to talk about Kubernetes again. Okay, sir. Does the removal of the node apply to just the new instance or the old instance? I had a cluster where I lost a node and I couldn't come back to the cluster. What do you, mm, this sounds like, a, uh, sounds like a question for Xiong, and it might take longer to answer it than me standing right here. But I'll make sure you talk to him before everybody leaves here. Um, yes. Uh, what exactly is the difference between Kubernetes and Dates? Oh, jeez. Okay. So, <clears throat> so I have to answer this in a very politically correct mode. Um, Deus, I think, I think their tagline is like bringing a Heroku-like pass experience to the data center. Um, they're effectively giving you, like, and I know this is way oversimplifying it, but a Git hook to deploy something. Kubernetes is not giving you that same workflow. It's the layer below Deus. So this is something that Deus could schedule to, and I believe that's actually um, a plan for Deus in the future as an open source tool. Um, but they, they operate at two different layers. And yes, there's a lot of overlap in all of these tools, like Mesos, Fleet, Kubernetes, Deus, everything right now. Um, but hopefully over the next few months, clear winners come out and we understand what we should be using. <laughs> not saying don't use Deus, I love Deus. Sure. So what uh, is the ARPs on the access control side of the SCP? The question is, I'm exposing SCP to all the containers. Okay. Yes. And I'm going to demo that live for you today. All right. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, that's it. Thank you, guys. <laughs>